what we're looking to do is to really change the way that companies show up in the world. And in order to make that change, we have to think about the system in which companies operate. So companies aren't operating in a vacuum. They're operating in our current capital markets, which are really overly focused on the short term. And we want to create a new system. And that new system is something that will enable companies to act differently. So when the focus is on quarterly reports, and as, as you heard from the last question, in fact, in the last uh, session with Hero, when that focus is too heavily on quarterly reporting, that puts a lot of pressure on companies to behave in short-term ways and to make short-term decisions. And when that happens, we all lose. Um, for me, when I was at the Treasury Department in the last financial crisis, this became abundantly clear because what we could see was that there were financial companies that had taken actions that were having a real negative impact on their customers, on their communities, and on the economy as a whole. And that was because they had acted in ways that were too focused on short-term results and weren't focused on the broader picture. And so we wanna change that kind of behavior by changing the whole system. And we wanna create a different kind of financial market that allows for a different kind of capitalism. Now, the reason that a stock exchange is the way to do that is really for two reasons. The first is that if you want to change the system, you have to change the rules. And that's what stock exchanges do they make rules. They make listing standards that companies that list on the exchange have to follow. And our rules are all geared toward that long-term focus. What we're trying to do is create a place where companies can maintain their focus on their long-term mission and vision, and at the same time, be accountable for their impact on the broader world. So to make these rules, we created um, five core principles. And those core principles are really about how you can put them together to come up with a long-term system. And the core principles also have some specific requirements with them. And these requirements are very different than those of any existing exchange. So for example, companies that list with us commit to adopting publicly a policy on diversity and inclusion. And that's incredibly important in today's world, of course. Um, companies that list with us commit to investing for the long term in their employees. Also very important and in the current system treated as overhead rather than investment. And companies that list with us commit to taking in a certain approach to the environment. So. Um, there's a bunch of other standards as well, but the broader point is that these standards taken together create a different kind of commitment than companies can make now because it's a different set of rules than any stock exchange has. And that commitment is the second reason that a stock exchange is important. Um, we're in a moment where there's a real move to change capitalism. There's moves towards stakeholder capitalism and there's a desire to really think about things differently. And we've seen that everything from the business roundtable letter to different types of pledges and frameworks. And it's become really difficult for a company that really means it and really intends to operate differently to distinguish itself. How can that company show that they're not just signing on to something because it's kind of the interesting thing of the day, but in fact, they intend to operate differently. And listing on a stock exchange is a legally binding commitment. It's a way to say publicly, we are not only operating this way today, but we intend to continue to operate this way. And that sounds a really powerful signal. It's a powerful signal to a company's investors, to their customers, to their employees. And it's a powerful signal that those groups can then use to make decisions about what companies they want to invest in, what companies they want to buy products from, and where they want to work, because increasingly that really matters to people. I think we're in the current moment. We have an opportunity for a reset. We have a chance to really change our system. And if we can create a long-term focus system where companies are freed up to really make long-term choices, what those companies will end up doing is creating more long-term value. And that's good for companies, but they'll also do it in a way that's better for the rest of us. And this is the type of new system that we need. We need it because it's the right thing to do, but we also need it because it's the only way that we can create a system of capitalism that is more sustainable, more equitable, and something that will work for everybody. So 
I feel optimistic. I feel optimistic that in this current moment, we can use this reset to change capitalism. And I think this is one area that we really can build back better. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Michelle. Um, you and I talked about it. In this moment, the last thing that most companies want is to be judged on quarterly results um, because the near term <laughs> numbers are often pretty, pretty bad. Um, but I'm curious what you, you know, it seems like a lot of um, the response to quarterly results is the availability of data. Like there's so much data out there. And even if the companies themselves aren't providing them, sometimes they're provided by a third party um, research firms, you know, there are satellites looking in on parking lots and, and all of this data is collected and put out there. And so how do you, you can't sort of stop the flow of that. So how do you, how will companies kind of manage that against, you know, you can't, you can't stop that from getting into the hands of investors. So, so what do companies do to kind of refocus? How will the market help them refocus on the long term despite that? Yeah, it, it's a great point. And look, more information is a good thing. And particularly if it's information that investors can use and, and employees and customers and other stakeholders can use to really make smart choices that align with their own values. So what's really important here is that we recraft the narrative. Right now, the narrative is too focused in the financial markets on quarterly earnings per share. And that's just not the right way to judge where a company's going or how it's impacting the world or how it's going to succeed over the long term. So what we're really trying to do is rewrite the narrative for success. Companies should have their own plan for how they're going to succeed over the long term. They need to tell their stakeholders, including their investors, how they're going to measure success over that journey, because of course there still has to be accountability, but the accountability should be for the right things. It shouldn't be for quarterly EPS. It should be for your long-term plan, your long-term strategy, and how you're executing against that. And importantly, how your execution against that is impacting a broader group of stakeholders and the world. So one of your principles focuses on time horizons, but you let the companies or you're going to let them co companies themselves define what they consider long term. Why did you make that decision? And does that create challenges for investors in terms of like comparing one company to another? Yeah, we so we took a principles based approach generally because what we found was that it was really important to not try and do a one size fits all. You know, long term in a retail company might be very different than long term in an energy company, for example, right? And what you want the company to be able to articulate is what are the time horizons that you're, they are using for different things, right? So you have some companies that will say our time horizon is infinite. But obviously they don't do strategic planning for an infinite time horizon, right? So do you do your strategic planning over three years or five years? And how do you use those different time horizons um, for different activities and, and values within the company? And sharing that information publicly with your stakeholders so that they understand what that means and how you approach that, that's an important part of kind of rewriting the na narrative and getting to the point where we can be talking about success in a more meaningful way than quarterly financial results. That makes sense. I, I also wanted to dig into another one of the principles um, around compensation, to, just to illustrate the difference. Um, typically, executive compensation is disclosed to shareholders. What will be different about what's disclosed for a company on the LTSC? Yeah, so there is a lot of disclosure around executive compensation, but I'm not sure there's a lot of effective disclosure around executive compensation, right? So there, there's a lot of information, but sometimes you can't even tell from that information what the actual compensation is. So what we're trying to do is not to require more not helpful um, transparency around compensation. What we want companies to do is instead to talk about their policy around compensation. How do they think about linking compensation to long-term success? And it doesn't require additional 
um, disclosure around any particular executive's compensation. It requires additional disclosure around how the company is going to make those important links. And when we were doing our work to devise these standards, executive compensation was actually the number one concern of investors. So it, it's something that investors are really paying attention to and that they feel like they don't necessarily have the right kind of information despite all those requirements. When companies uh, report sort of how they're adhering to your principles, how will you share that with LTSE investors? And like, how often will it be disclosed? Will it be quarterly, dare I ask? <laughs> yeah, so um, the way that the system works is there are these five principles and companies need to develop policies around each one. They develop metrics that are specific to their company and they share those publicly. So the policies are publicly available all the time on the company's website. Of course, if they make any change to the policy, that's something that they would disclose when they make that change. Um, but in terms of the ongoing reporting requirement, we don't want to make it a quarterly report. We, we don't think that's the right time frame. We think it's when there's a material change and then updating at least annually. But because they do keep these um, policies public, any time that they change, um, the public will know about that, investors will know about that. And that's something that all of their stakeholders can have transparency into. So how will you hold them accountable? I mean, and, and so this isn't just some sort of squishy marketing message. I mean, will you be monitoring their, how they update and how they, I mean, you're, are, you, are you making sure they're doing it? Yeah, so accountability was really important to us. And of course, this is where you have to balance how prescriptive are you going to be and um, how do you still find accountability even in a principles-based system? And that's something that we really are really committed to and find really important. So it happens in a couple of different ways. First of all, when companies initially list with us and they develop these policies in these five, in these five areas, we actually, as the exchange, make a judgment about whether those policies are consistent with the underlying principles. So for example, if someone came along and said, you know, our environmental policy is to burn fossil fuels forever because we think climate change is false. Well, that's not actually a long-term environmental policy. So you may have a policy, but it doesn't actually comply with a long-term principle. So there's that initial check of, do they comply with the principles? Um, the policies themselves are made public, but then there's also a whole series of information that we receive as the regulator within the exchange. And that information is something that we use to make sure that the company's not just saying we're gonna do this, they have a real actionable plan for implementation and that they have ways that they're going to make sure that it's really happening within the company. You know, It's gotten board approval if that's necessary, or there's a plan to enact it throughout the company. So it has to be really actionable. And then the other piece of this is that these policies are part of the listing standards and that's a, a very serious commitment for companies. And if companies put out there into the world, pursuant to the listing standards, that they are going to do something, there is a really legally binding obligation to do that. So we, we think there is a serious level of accountability here. I have such a long list of questions, but I think we should take a few from the audience. So if we'll have the first one up. There it is from Chad Byrne. Is it more important to get a large company to modify their short term behavior or for smaller startups to start with that philosophy? Both. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we, we do. We are actually working on both ends of that spectrum because we do think both are important. Um, we want to see this change for big existing public companies. They can dual list with with us. So it's not that they have to change that. But we want to see those behavior changes with big existing companies, but we also think it's really important to start early because the earlier that a company starts thinking this way, the more embedded it becomes in their culture, in their operations. And as they grow, that will just become something that they incorporate in a stage appropriate way as they move forward. And then when they're ready to list, there will be a public market that aligns with those values. So, so we think it's not an either or, it's a both. Okay, we'll take another question. Um, from Stephen, do Bitcoin and Bitcoin and other digital currencies benefit a long term market? That's an interesting question, and it's not um, 
you know, it's not one that we've spent a lot of time focusing on, to be honest, because um, we're initially working within the, the U.S. system as it exists. Now, later phases might move in different directions, but we feel like initially we want to start working within the current system and then we'll start looking at all of these other issues that could impact having a more long-term focused system holistically so not not something we're working on now but could be in phase two all right let's take one more from the audience and then um i have a one more question and then i think we have to get Hero and Chris back on. Um, so how long do you expect it will take to see widespread adoption of your ESG philosophy? Or maybe in other words, how long do you think it'll take before the market gets up and running? Well, so those are two different questions, but let, let me answer each of them. So um, where we are is we have all our approvals. We were getting ready to launch um, when the pandemic hit and so have delayed the launch um, just because we want to do it in a smart, you know, people first kind of way. So we will be launching in the coming months. Um, how the pandemic plays out in the coming months will influence exactly when, um, but soon. And we are already in conversation with a lot of companies. And if anything, I'd say the pandemic has actually really increased interest in this idea. So um, I hope that the answer to both of those questions is very soon. Um, but you know, we'll we'll have to wait and see um, how quickly the companies adopt uh, these changes. But we are we are very optimistic given the interest that we've seen in this current environment. So one of the um criticisms of short-term thinking, especially related to this current moment, where so many companies were hit incredibly hard um, with the pandemic and the loss of business was uh, around stock buybacks, which I think last year there was $700 billion worth of stock buybacks. And if you think about that now, well, you know, that if we were thinking long-term, that money might have been better spent you know, on shoring up balance sheets and taking care of employees. How do you think, do you think the behavior would be different for those companies on the LTSC? Yeah, I really do. Um, because I think excessive stock buybacks, I think are just a symptom of this short-term pressure. You know, why do companies do buybacks? Well, sometimes it's the best use of the capital, right? But as you say, the sheer volume of buybacks that we've been seeing seems to indicate that that's probably not the only buybacks that are taking place. So why else might companies do them? Well, if you want to make your numbers look better, making your denominator smaller is a good way to do that. So um, I do think a lot of the, the buybacks that have happened um, have been driven by this desire to meet quarterly numbers. And actually, there's some good academic evidence that shows that as well. So the hope is if we can remove that pressure and focus on this quarter, that hopefully companies will make buybacks when it makes sense, but not use them so excessively for reasons that are really about financial engineering. Yeah, it'd be nice if, if this long-term thinking really took off right now in this moment. Um